Thank you very much. Wow, uh, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I have to say there's, there's probably two people in the world you don't want to follow on stage when you're talking about this kind of stuff. One is Chris Anderson, the other guy is Clay Shirky. Uh, so I'm going to do my best, but that was awesome, both of you guys, really awesome. Uh, so yeah, um, Andrew told me I couldn't do my stump speech, which uh, you know is always annoying. But uh, I've come up with something else that I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk about seven ideas, and I want to sort of get through them quite quickly, just sort of give you things to think about. You might not agree with all of them. I'm still not sure I do, actually. Um, but yeah, so, so let's go. Can I have my slides, please? Thank you. I got them? I got them. OK, so yeah, I'm going to talk about seven different things that I think are becoming abundantly clear because of th th this new economic situation we find ourselves in. Um, Andrew said I, I, I write this book called The Pirate's Dilemma and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about that today. You can buy uh, scarce copies of it in the bookshop downstairs uh, <laughs> or you can download the abundant copy from my website. It's also up on the Pirate Bay and all the torrent sites if you don't have $25, that's fine. Um, and, and really the sort of big takeaway from the book uh, is, that, is that piracy isn't always a problem. As we've been discussing, information the way information flows has really changed. It used to be this one-way street. It's become this kind of two-way street, and and it's flying all over the place. And consumers have become producers, and receivers have become broadcasters. And so there's all this decentralization going on. And as Clay was saying, some people look at this and they see chaos, and kids are criminals and pirates, and we should be shutting all this stuff down because it's just causing problems. Well, the, the point of the book is that pirates also cause something else. Pirates often create solutions. And pirates may in fact be some of the greatest innovators on the face of the earth, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and so point one that I want to talk about is that if you want to beat piracy, sometimes the way to beat it isn't by fighting pirates, it's actually by, by copying them, by emulating what pirates do. And the reason for that is if, if pirates are adding value to, to a lot of your customers or your consumers, then then actually what's going on, it, piracy at that point is actually an example of, of market failure. And, and I came to sort of this, this counterintuitive conclusion at a fairly young age. I grew up here in London, uh, obsessed with music, um, specifically the music coming off all the pirate radio stations that exist all over the city. It's, pirate radio is a really unique thing in, in the UK. There are, at the last count Ofcom did in 2007, there were 150 pirate stations in London, and there are these tiny home-brewed radio stations that people set up in residential tower blocks or, or squats, and you, you make a homemade antenna and you tack it up to the roof and you broadcast music to the, to the city, and, and the higher up you are, the further out you get, and some of these pirate stations have millions of listeners, and it's to totally illegal, totally frowned on by the government and the police and everybody else. Um, I was a good kid growing up, I didn't get in a lot of trouble, but I had to become a pirate radio DJ as soon as I was kind of able to lift up a box of records because I could see this was really adding value to, to the music scenes that I was interested in. So I spent uh, most of my weekends at uh, the top of these tower blocks in West London. I, I used to DJ on a station called Ice FM, which was the, at the time the biggest pirate in South London. We had millions of listeners. And the police were coming out to catch us every single weekend, uh, to have detective vans and all kinds of things. And I was proud to say that I was never caught. Um, but bizarrely enough, the police used to also advertise with us. <laughs> right, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and the reason they used to advertise with us is because we had millions of listeners. And we were pirates and we were the bad guys. But at some level, we were adding value to the community. And they recognized that with their, their advertising money. So that was cool. So it kind of works like this. This is the, the London radio market. This is kind of as it exists for people broadcasting music to young people. And you've got two big stations, Kiss and Capital, in the commercial space, broadcasting music to young people. And they're, they're part of multi-million pound media organizations. They have lots of overheads. And uh, they're competing for the most listeners. So this means the same thing it means for playlist-driven radio stations all over the world, the same 20 songs 20 times a day. Well, the pirates are not in that space. And the pirates are kind of over here. They're in a different part of the, the radio market that's not really service. It's an example of, of market failure, because nobody in the market I I is, is making new music available in, an, in a, an abundant way. And that's really what pirate stations do. And it's, it's weird, because pirates also want to get the most listeners too, but 
Over here, the most experimental pirates tend to be the most popular. So this is kind of an incubator where innovation happens. This is where new music scenes germinate, new bands get their first big break, new DJs make their name. And it's a really interesting relationship. It's this kind of virtuous circle, if you will, because once something becomes popular on the pirates, it, once it's popular enough, it's then picked up by the commercial station. So new records are picked up, the most popular DJs are hired, like entire new radio stations have started. Kiss used to be a pirate. So it's, it's a really interesting situation. I was kind of al always fascinated, fascinated by how this works. And they, the, the commercial stations actually innovate by copying the pirates. And once something's pop popular enough, they, they, they hire the DJs or the record gets big. So that creates an incentive over here for people to keep on innovating. And so, so piracy isn't really a bug in this situation. It's a feature. And I think that's also true of the, the music industry more widely. If you look at what happened over the last 10 years, when, when Napster hit, it was this huge, huge deal, as uh, Clay was talking about. But the, the, the record companies didn't really see it like that. They, they didn't think this was something that they should be emulating. Even as Steve Jobs once said, if you really want to beat pirates, the, the way to beat them is to, is, to, is to copy them. And that's what he did when he created iTunes. So, so that's the kind of the, the economics, and that's kind of the big takeaway from the book. You should compete with pirates if they're doing something useful. But there are all these other really interesting cultural things happening because of piracy and because of abundance, and that's really what I want to talk about today, which brings me on to, to point two. This is a quote from Andy Warhol, and I think it's more true today than it's ever been. And, and, and Clay was talking about this, about how we're organizing without organizations, and we're doing all these really cool things. And I think we've seen all through the, the event how how the line between for-profits and non-profits is, is blurring and how, how sort of meaning is, is increasing in importance everywhere. Uh, but I think, I think because of abundance and because, of, because we're able to sort of turn business models upside down more easily than ever before, I think the way that we rebel as a society is actually changing. And just to give you an example of what I mean, imagine, if you will, you're in your, your 20s and you're growing up in the, the 1970s and there's nothing good on TV and you think, culture's all terrible. Well, a good way to sort of rebel about that and speak out against that is maybe, maybe you start a punk band with some of your friends, like I know, I know Chris did. Um, and if you're really, really lucky, maybe you'll get signed uh, like the Sex Pistols did and you might make lots of money and lots of people will hear your message until somebody uses your message to sell fizzy drinks or whatever. Well, today that's not the only way to rebel. If you're three guys in your 20s today and uh, you're not you're not happy with what's on TV, well, you can start an alternative to TV, like the three guys behind YouTube did. And, you know, if you're really lucky, you might actually change things, and maybe Google will buy you for $1.65 billion. So the ways that we, we kill bad ideas is, is kind of changing, and music isn't really the only way to rebel. But I think lots of other things are changing. I think the, the, the way that we tell stories I is starting to change. Most of what I do is, is in different ways, is, is I'm involved in telling stories of various kinds. And I'm, I'm seeing this change in all the things that I do. There's this sort of very linear form of telling stories, and there's different structures in different, uh, different formats, so like a three-act structure in movies or a seven-act structure in TV or whatever. Well, it, it, it's kind of starting to work differently. The two largest, fastest-selling forms of media in US history are actually the video games Halo 3 and GTA 4. And both of these, both these things have great linear stories, but that's not really where the value is. The value's not here because this relationship's changed. It, it's, it's, it's here. It's this kind of the, the art of storytelling is becoming networked, and network effects apply. It's about being part of a conversation and, and being in the middle of it and letting people. It's not just telling people a good story, which I think is still important, will always be important. It's about giving people space to tell good stories themselves, and we're still, we're still not getting this quite right, and which brings me on to my, my next point. You should never let the legal team ruin a good remix uh, without talking to the marketing department first, and we're seeing this happen again and again. Uh, one of my favorite examples um, is, a, is something that happened when the movie Die Hard 4 was, uh, was being released. Sorry, hang on a second. So this is a video a band called Guys Night made. I'm going to show you the video. Oh. Can you hear that? Well, 
there you go. Wow, that was like my pirate radio days. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, so you get the idea. This band made a song about, it was, it's really funny, you should check the whole thing out on YouTube, about, uh, the, this, it's just the synopsis of the first three Die Hard films. And they threw it up on YouTube, and it got millions of hits, and people think it's very funny. And uh, at the time, um, uh, the marketing team at Fox are trying to work out how to get people excited about Die Hard 4, and they're trying to come up with an online strategy. How do we get to millions of people and get them excited about Die Hard? And they hadn't seen this video. The legal team at Fox had seen the video, and they did their jobs, what they're supposed to do. They called Guys Night and said, can you please take this down? You're infringing on our copyright. And Guys Night like, oh, yeah, you know, fair enough. And they did. And then a couple of weeks later, the marketing team found out about this video, and they called Guys Night. How much do we have to pay you to put that video you made on YouTube? <laughs> so, so yeah, we're still, we're still working this out. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. But abundance is actually better than advertising, and uh, we're talking about digital stuff, but piracy doesn't just affect digital stuff. It affects physical goods, all kinds of physical goods all over the world. Um, and one industry that has a real problem with piracy is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it's, there's a really big example of, of market failure going on here. We have a patent system which means that a lot of people in developing countries can't afford to pay Western prices for their meds, and so lots of patented meds are just reverse engineered in, in places like Argentina and China and Brazil and Thailand. And so you have all these pirates kind of over here producing, producing generic meds and, and actually the governments of the countries I just mentioned all, all sanction that because letting your, letting your citizens die because they can't afford drugs isn't really a vote winner. Um, but the pharmaceutical industry also has a huge image problem. It, 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 it works like this. Like they, they, these companies spend more on advertising than they do on research and development, which is crazy when you think about the billions they spend on research and development. And nobody likes them. Nobody likes the drug companies. They, they have this really bad image problem, things like the Vioxx scandal or whatever it is. People just assume they're these evil corporate monoliths. And these two problems don't really seem connected. But Novartis saw a way to actually connect it. They saw an opportunity over here. They saw a way to sort of fix their image problem by competing with pirates. So they went into Thailand uh, recently where uh, this anti -leu this leukemia drug that they produce, um, which is patented, was being pirated uh, a lot. And they started giving away the original drug for free and, and just making some noise about that, letting people know that that's what they were doing. They've done similar initiatives in India. Um, and it's starting to change people's perception of the company. They're starting to be known as the, like, the socially responsible drug company. And they've been winning corporate social responsibility re re awards. And that's really cool, because they can't do that with their advertising dollars. They can't make people feel good. So the point is using abundance can actually, can actually using abundance to do good things can actually be better than advertising in this new economy. And I don't think we need to be scared of, of abundance, because actually, and, and this is really what Chris talks about, a, a, lot, a lot of good experiences are always going to be really, really scarce. Like um, a good example is, is Hollywood. Think about Hollywood. Hollywood is being ravaged by pirates. You, we hear about this all the time. You see the warning at the beginning of the video. Uh, I, I live in New York City now. Um, and last summer, down on Canal Street in Chinatown, which is like the main place to go to get pirate handbags and DVDs and all these kind of things, talking to some of the, the DVD vendors selling pirate DVDs, and they were complaining that people downloading movies was affecting their business. <laughs> When the pirates in your industry are complaining about the other pirates, you have a problem, <laughs> right? But last summer was Hollywood's largest ever summer at the box office. They made $4.1 billion. And this summer, they nearly, they nearly beat that again. Why? Because this is not the same thing as this. You can't get this experience here. This is a totally different thing. If, you, if you're really passionate about a movie, a $5 DVD filmed on a camera phone is never going to be enough. You're going to want to be there on the opening night watching it with 300 complete strangers. So, so Hollywood's you know, it's in rude health despite, despite this massive, massive piracy problem they have. And this, this really brings me to my last point, and I've been thinking about virtuous circles a lot. I'm, I might write a book about, about these. I'm still trying to figure out if there's even a book there. But it, it's really interesting, because in an economy based on abundance, you, you really have to think about 
solving this with a, like a systems-based solution. It's about it's about incorporating the fans and the remixes, but it, but it's also if something's if something's out there and there's abundant ways for people to get it and steal it for free, you've also got to give them legitimate ways to get to get to get it and, and to pay for it and, and create this kind of experience. And uh, I've been working with a guy called Jesse Alexander, the executive producer of a show called. Heroes, we're trying to turn, uh, we're, we're doing this TV series called Pirate TV, which will sort of look at all these issues. And it's been really interesting talking to him and the creators of Heroes about what they do, because it actually works like this. It's this kind of virtuous circle. Heroes is one of the most pirated TV shows on the web. And the TV show is kind of, that, that's where they get most of their money and stuff. But they've set up this system where they've got all these, all these revenue streams which sort of reinforce each other. So there's like the obvious things like, selling merchandise, but then a any story arc that doesn't make it to, to an episode of the show is then published as a, a, a comic. The DC Comics um, actually sell the printed versions. They give away a PDF with every episode online. There's all these webisodes and story storylines going off on other tangents on NBC.com, and they've got a ton of revenue streams, and then all these fan sites. Last year, Heroes made $50 million, not including uh, the TV show. Ad revenue, just from all these other all these other places. So the point is to really is to really think about this as a, a sort of a, a, an entire ecosystem. Some some things will bring in money, and some things will just bring you attention. But it's just about working out a way that they can kind of reinforce each other, so that if the money does move and and pirates are attacking a certain part of your business model, then you have other places where value's just constantly being added. And it, it's not always about fighting with pirates. Sometimes it's better to compete with them in the marketplace. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is really the pirate's dilemma. Thank you very much.